Hello everyone, my name is Gary O'Mealy, and in this video we are going to talk about the pancreas and its endocrine functions and the hormones that it secretes. So the pancreas is kind of famous as an endocrine organ, but the reality is that it actually has both exocrine and endocrine functions. In fact, if you're actually considering the mass of the pancreas, about 99% of the mass of the pancreas is dedicated to its exocrine functions. And by exocrine functions, we're really talking about the production and secretion of digestive enzymes that will be secreted into the common bile duct to help with uh, digestion of foods and the emulsifications of fat that are moving through the GI tract. Now, of course, with the endocrine function, you probably are kind of aware of this already based on what we talked about in chapter 24. Uh, we're talking about the production and secretion of insulin and glucagon into the blood for the sake of regulating blood glucose. So, like I said, about 99% of pancreatic tissue exists for the purpose of making these digestive enzymes. But if we want to be focusing on the endocrine functions, we need to really zoom in microscopically on little patches of hormone secreting cells that are found intermittently throughout the pancreatic tissue. And these patches are called islets of Langerhans. So if we look at a illustration of what a section of pancreatic tissue might look like, you, of course, have your exocrine tissue over here, uh, and typically they manifest as a circular arrangement of cuboidal epithelial cells called acinar cells. These are the cells that are actually synthesizing and secreting uh, pancreatic digestive enzymes, and the lumen of this uh, circular arrangement is continuous with the common bile duct. So if we get secretion of these digestive enzymes into the lumen here, those digestive enzymes through the secretions will make their way into the common bile duct and should do their job in emulsifying fats and aiding in other um, means of digestion. Now, for the endocrine function, we want to be focusing over here on this big patch of cells over here. Now, there are several different types of cells that we can identify here. We have beta cells, alpha cells, delta cells, F cells, and epsilon cells. And then, of course, we can see through the cross-section here, we can see cross-sections of capillaries. Again, this has been the case, and we saw this with the thyroid and maybe a couple of other places. When you're looking at a cross-section of tissue, especially endocrine tissue, you're going to see lots of intermittent blood vessels. And that should make sense, not just because we're dealing with tissue that has pretty high energy requirements in terms of receiving nutrition and oxygen, but we also need a thoroughfare through which to send our hormone. Do not forget what makes a hormone a hormone. A hormone is a signaling molecule that travels through the blood. Therefore, if all these different cells here are going to be synthesizing and secreting hormones, we need the blood supply nearby to carry those hormones to where they need to go. Now, this is kind of an obvious question, but what do you think seems to be the most abundant kind of cell in the islets? Well, if you said the beta cells, you are absolutely right. So let's give a summary of what each type of cell tends to do. The general idea is each kind of cell synthesizes and secretes one kind of hormone. The alpha cells secrete glucagon, the beta cells secrete insulin, and through our discussion of chapter 24, you are hopefully already aware that these two hormones work together and compete with each other in glucose homeostasis. So we will learn a lot more about them later on. In fact, I'm going to continue listing off all the different hormones that are secreted by the different cells here. But in spite of that, our focus is still going to be in the long term on insulin and glucagon. The delta cells secrete somatostatin, which might sound familiar to you, okay? It might sound familiar to you because we saw that this is a hormone that is secreted by the hypothalamus. Although, interestingly enough, somatostatin does not, does not act as a hormone here. It is acting as a paracrine regulator of some of the other hormones that we see here.
F cells secrete a hormone called pancreatic polypeptide. This is a hormone we're not really going to talk too much about. It is there to help regulate the ACE and R cells in their synthesis and secretion of their digestive enzymes. And then you have the epsilon cells, which, which secrete a hormone called ghrelin, which also aids in digestion, and it also contributes to the feeling of satiety after you eat a meal. So like I said, long-term, our focus is going to be on glucose homeostasis and insulin and glucagon. So both the alpha and the beta cells contain surface receptors that help them to detect levels of glucose in the extracellular fluid. So we've looked at examples earlier in the semester in glucose homeostasis back when we were getting practice with identifying what's the stimulus, what's the sensor, what's the control center, and so on. So we saw that in cases like that, the pancreas acts as both the sensor and the control center. So having these glucose receptors on their plasma membranes allows the alpha and beta cells to not only act as sensors for glucose, but their ability to then go on to produce either insulin or glucagon makes them control centers as well. So insulin and glucagon are classical antagonistic hormones. Don't forget an earlier lecture we had on the types of hormonal interactions. Insulin is going to control blood glucose and cause it to come down. And glucagon also controls blood glucose, but instead causes it to rise. So our definition of antagonistic hormones were two hormones that both have control over the same parameter, in this case, blood glucose, but they affect changes in opposite directions. So for that reason, you're not real likely to ever see insulin and glucagon in the blood acting at the same time because they would essentially cancel each other out. Okay, now let's deal with kind of a philosophical question here. What, what even is the purpose of managing blood glucose? Why do we care if it gets too high? Well, why do we care if it gets too low? There are actually very important reasons that we want to manage our blood glucose and keep it within a range of about 70 to 110 milligrams per deciliter. So a little bit of a review here. Hopefully you haven't forgotten what glucose is, but if you have, glucose is a monosaccharide and it is particularly important among sugars in that it is the most commonly used substrate for cellular respiration and the production of ATP by body cells. So glucose is what gets the party started uh, through the glycolysis process that of course produces uh, pyruvate, which then gets turned into acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA gets fed into the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle, if you prefer. And then eventually that will produce the NADH and the FADH2 that are the reducing equivalents for powering oxidative phosphorylation and the electron transport chain. And you end up producing a lot of ATP. So your focus should be on ATP production and the fact that glucose is the most common a fuel that we use to make lots and lots of ATP. But we also learned uh, back in chapter 3 and chapter 24, glucose is not the only usable fuel for cellular respiration. We, of course, can also use fatty acids. We can use proteins, even though we would prefer not to use proteins. So we also learned that fatty acids actually on a per molecule basis will produce a lot more ATP than glucose. So the question then becomes, if we can get away with using fatty acids and proteins for energy, why are we going so far out of our way to maintain the serum concentration of glucose, okay? Well, there's actually one very, very, very important reason we want to keep glucose at a certain level at all. So of all the cells in your body, the cells of your brain are by far the pickiest in terms of what, they'll, what they will eat and what they won't eat when it comes to making ATP through cellular respiration. So the image we're kind of invoking here is that the brain is kind of like a baby or a toddler that's sitting in a high chair and doesn't want to eat vegetables, doesn't want to eat beans. It only wants to eat dinosaur nuggets and macaroni and cheese, okay? So the cells of the brain are extremely, extremely picky. The cells of the brain really only want to use glucose for cellular respiration. You absolutely cannot get cells of the brain to feed on fatty acids. They will only feed on glucose. 
So because cells of the brain only derive ATP for glucose, that's why we have to have a hormone-driven mechanism to ensure there is always a sufficient and adequate amount of glucose in the blood because it's all for the sake of keeping the brain well-nourished. It stands to reason if the brain isn't getting the energy it needs, you're going to have a whole lot of stuff fall apart if the brain is not working properly. So hypoglycemia another fancy word for low blood glucose levels, that is absolutely toxic to brain tissue. Okay, so if we graph out what blood glucose levels might look like throughout the day for a person in a 24-hour period, it might look a little something like this. You're going to have periods where the blood glucose gets a little on the high side, kind of on the upper end of that normal range, and there will be times when it gets a little on the low side, but everything should be okay Everything should be normal as long as we are staying within that normal range, right? We learned this in the very first lecture of the semester. So the point we're trying to get across here is that uh, you don't want to get too high and you don't want to get too low. So if you get too low, that's hypoglycemia, which we just established is toxic to the brain, hyperglycemia, the issue of having too much glucose in the blood, this is a little bit more complicated to rationalize and to understand, but the idea is that hyperglycemia is toxic to other tissues like peripheral nerves, uh, the nerves of your fingers and your toes, blood vessels, and the retina. So the idea here is that a diabetic, whether they're type 1 or type 2, usually type 2 since those seem to be a lot more common these days, uh, type 2 and type 1 diabetics are basically constantly in a state of hyperglycemia. So this is why you hear of things like diabetic neuropathy, diabetic retinopathy. These things are very closely associated with having too much glucose in your blood. Okay, so if we go beyond that and look at this graph again, what is the rationale for how we use insulin and glucagon to keep our blood glucose well regulated? Well, the idea, of course, is that one of the two hormones will do its thing when blood glucose gets too high, and that's going to be insulin. So when the beta cells of the pancreas sense that glucose is getting too high, they start producing and secreting insulin, and insulin, through the actions and mechanism that we will talk about here in a little bit, should bring blood glucose back down. Conversely, when blood glucose gets a little too low, the alpha cells of the pancreas will sense that and will secrete glucagon, and through its mechanism, which again we will talk about in just a little bit, should bring blood glucose back up. So as long as the production and secretion of insulin and glucagon are both well-managed and well-regulated, there's really no reason why our blood glucose should ever fall outside this normal range of 70 to 110 milligrams per deciliter. But of course, we know that's not always the case, especially with diabetes. Okay, when we talk about where glucose comes from, most of the glucose that our cells consume is going to come from the food that we eat on a daily basis. So you're going to want to recall that any excess glucose that we eat, so excess meaning that glucose that is in our bodies that is not immediately needed for ATP production, this is going to be stored long term as glycogen, which is a big polysaccharide of glucose in the liver and in skeletal muscle, and excess glucose can also be uh, loaded up in adipose tissue and through uh, uh, several metabolic processes can also be converted into triglycerides, which can be incorporated into fat. And we also learned back in chapter 24 when we talked about energy balance, your blood glucose levels will fluctuate throughout the day depending on what you eat and how long it's been since you've eaten it. So we talked about the fed state and the fasted state. So that is going to become very relevant here again. Okay, so let's start talking about mechanism here. Insulin and glucagon, as we've established, are both going to act to counter deviations to blood glucose, deviations from the normal range. So if you picture this as kind of like a gauge on the dashboard of your car, we want the uh, needle to be right in that green area there. We don't want it to dip into the red on either side. 
So because we desire a balance in glucose here, you can kind of conveniently think of the regulation as balancing a seesaw or a teeter-totter, okay? So when blood glucose is in a state of balance like this, where blood glucose is neither high nor low, there really shouldn't be a need for the pancreas to secrete either of these two hormones. Neither insulin nor glucagon will be secreted as long as blood glucose is normal. But we, of course, know that's not how things work. So when you eat a meal or a snack or whatever it is, when you get food into your system, your digestive system will break down complex carbohydrates and produce a lot of glucose that will be absorbed across your intestinal epithelia and into the blood. So this is going to overload your bloodstream with glucose that just came from the food that you digested and ate. So this is going to cause your blood glucose to get a little on the high side. So that's going to shift the balance, and of course the beta cells of the pancreas will sense that the blood glucose is too high. So they are going to respond by secreting insulin, and insulin's mechanism of action that we're about to talk about here in just a second should cause blood glucose levels to come back down into the normal range. Logically, that is how it should work, so we are about to demonstrate that indeed that is how it works. So insulin is going to trigger cells in the body, very specific cells and tissues in the body, to take up glucose from the blood and extracellular fluid by facilitated diffusion. The idea here is that if there's too much glucose in the blood, let's move that excess glucose from the blood to the inside of cells. So through doing that, we should bring the blood glucose levels back down. Now this does not apply to all cells in the body, so there are only very specific cells in the body that have an insulin-dependent glucose transport mechanism. The cells I am about to list here will transport glucose and will absorb glucose from the blood regardless of whether insulin is present or not. So that includes red blood cells, brain cells. Brain cells are particularly important because since we've established that brain cells will only feed on glucose, they better be able to get access to glucose whenever they want, even when insulin is not there liver cells. So the liver is very commonly misattributed as a target for insulin, but it really isn't. So liver will uptake glucose regardless of whether uh, insulin is present or not. So the liver really doesn't have insulin receptors. Uh, kidney cells have glucose, or, uh, excuse me, have uh, insulin independent glucose uptake and then intestinal cells do as well. So when we're talking about cells and tissues in the body that actually depend on insulin, we're really going to be just talking about skeletal muscle and adipose tissue. Those are going to be your two major tissues that uh, express the insulin receptor and therefore can respond to secreted insulin. So here is a flow chart and a diagram that shows how the insulin signaling mechanism should work. So our stimulus is high blood glucose. The beta cells of the pancreas act as both the sensor and the control center here. Insulin is our output signal, which travels through the bloodstream to the effectors or targets, which again are skeletal muscle and adipose tissue. And then this gray arrow here is meant to represent the mechanism by which these uh, tissues take glucose out of the blood and thereby produce the response of lowering blood glucose, which of course, once we get that blood glucose back into the normal range, that should uh, produce a negative feedback mechanism, which prevents the pancreas from producing too much insulin. So skeletal muscle will uptake glucose once insulin binds to its receptor and use it to store the glucose as glycogen. Adipose tissue, when it gets stimulated with insulin, will take up glucose from the blood and store it as triglycerides and then as fat. Okay, so let's talk about the specific mechanism. And keep in mind, the insulin receptor is something that only skeletal muscle and adipose tissue really have. So the insulin receptor is a type of receptor that we talked about before called a tyrosine kinase receptor, okay? So what you're seeing here is the cell membrane of a skeletal muscle fiber or an adipose tissue cell, an adipocyte. So this insulin receptor consists of two subunits, 
where the insulin binding domain is facing towards the extracellular fluid because that's going to be where insulin comes from. Now, the idea for these cells, for these insulin sensitive cells, is that there is, when blood glucose is high, there is going to be a high concentration of glucose in the extracellular fluid compared to a low concentration in the intracellular fluid. So there is a clear concentration gradient that glucose would like to follow, but because there is no available carrier for the very polar glucose molecule, glucose cannot diffuse through the membrane all by itself. So even though there is a glucose gradient, skeletal muscle and adipose tissue cannot take up glucose from the blood in the absence of insulin because there is no carrier available to let the glucose across. Okay, so if we take a peek further inside the cell, these insulin-sensitive, insulin-dependent cells actually do have glucose transporters, but in the absence of insulin, these transporters are stuck on the inside of the cell. These glucose transporters are called GLUT4. This is a glucose transporter, but its default location is not in the plasma membrane where it needs to be. Its default location is that it is stuck inside a transport vesicle, just kind of floating around inside the intracellular fluid. So in the absence of insulin, and you can see that there is no insulin present here because we don't see it bound to the receptor. In the absence of insulin, we cannot absorb glucose because GLUT4 is stuck inside the cell. So let's take a look at how insulin will actually change this. So when this cell or this tissue gets stimulated with insulin that has just been delivered through the bloodstream from the pancreas, insulin will bind to the receptor. The receptor will dimerize and autophosphorylate itself so the receptor becomes activated. This is going to produce a phosphorylation cascade. So lots of proteins inside the cell are going to get phosphorylated like we learned back in the uh, cell communication uh, unit. And through uh, a couple of different mechanisms and a couple of different signaling pathways that we're not going to get into here, this is going to cause that transport vesicle that contains GLUT4 to fuse with the plasma membrane. So if this vesicle fuses with the plasma membrane, that will insert the GLUT4 carrier into the plasma membrane, and now it is available to do its job. It can now let glucose move via facilitated diffusion from the extracellular fluid to the intracellular fluid. So this transport of glucose from the blood, from the extracellular fluid to the inside of skeletal muscle or adipose tissue is only possible if insulin is present and insulin is activating those insulin receptors. We saw before that if insulin is not present, none of this is possible because this glucose transporter is not there. Okay, so our conclusion here is that Pancreatic beta cells will secrete insulin when they sense that blood glucose is too high. So as insulin causes its targets to uptake glucose from the blood, glucose levels will go back to normal. So here, even though we are in the fed state and our blood glucose was momentarily a little bit high because of the food that we just digested and absorbed, insulin acts as a counterbalance to make sure that we keep our blood glucose nice and well-balanced and well-regulated. And then, of course, through the negative feedback mechanism, insulin production will stop when we get near the set point again and back into the normal range. So remember, this is a type of signaling pathway called a simple endocrine reflex. Okay, so let's look at the opposite scenario. When it has been a long time since you've eaten, we call that the fasted state, right? So in those cases, glucose in your bloodstream will become depleted due to the constant uptake of glucose by the brain and by other cells that tend to prefer glucose for their cellular respiration activities. So this is going to cause blood glucose to get a little bit on the low side. So here you're going to be float, uh, flirting with hypoglycemia. This is again going to shift the balance except in the opposite direction. And this time it's going to be the alpha cells that are going to sense that blood glucose is too low. 
So what we want to happen here is glucagon will be secreted. So it has to be glucagon. It wouldn't do us any good to secrete insulin here because insulin only lowers your blood glucose. And we definitely don't want to make our problem worse here. So glucagon will be secreted and through its mechanism of action, this will cause blood glucose levels to come back up into the normal range. So what we're going to see here, although we're not really going to dive too much into the specific details of it, glucagon's mechanism is more or less the opposite of insulin's. So if insulin's mechanism was focused on absorbing glucose from the blood, glucagon's is going to focus on exporting glucose from tissues back into the blood. So cells and tissues that store glucose as glycogen or store fat, they will be induced to uh, metabolize glycogen or metabolize fat to produce glucose and then export and release that glucose back into the blood, thereby bringing your levels back up. So our major targets here are going to be the same as last time, skeletal muscle and adipose tissue, except this time the liver is also a target. So the liver actually does have glucagon receptors. So we can actually stimulate the release of glucose from all the glycogen that is stored up in the liver. Okay, so the signaling mechanism here, as far as homeostasis goes, is going to look pretty familiar. Our stimulus is low blood glucose. The alpha cells act as the sensor and the control center. Glucagon is our output signal released into the bloodstream and it travels to our three target tissues through the bloodstream. And through that mechanism, mechanism of action that we'll talk about on the next slide, we will replenish glucose into the blood, bring it back up, and then that should shut everything else down by negative feedback. So again, liver and skeletal muscle will store glucose up long-term as glycogen, so they, through the mechanism of glucagon, will be induced to break down their glycogen into individual glucose molecules and then export their glucose back into the extracellular fluid and into the bloodstream. Adipose tissue will be metabolically induced to convert stored fat back into glucose through the gluconeogenesis process. Okay, so if we look at the glucagon receptor, it's a little different compared to the insulin receptor because the glucagon receptor is actually a G-protein coupled receptor, which we have talked about a lot in previous lessons. And we are going to see a lot in future lessons because... G-protein coupled receptors are not just a part of the endocrine system, they are an important part of the nervous system as well. So I would highly recommend you go back and review G-protein coupled receptors if you're feeling a little bit unfamiliar with it. So here, without glucagon present, this receptor is inactive because you can see all three subunits of the G-protein are held together. So these cells liver, skeletal muscle, and adipose tissue will maintain their storage of glycogen and or fat. But once this tissue or any of these three tissues receive glucagon from the bloodstream, when glucagon binds, this is going to activate enzymes inside the cell that will hydrolyze glycogen into glucose or activate gluconeogenesis. So we're not really going to dive into the specific signaling cascade downstream of the activation of the G protein here. Uh, there's going to be kind of a lot of things going on, including second messenger cascades, phosphorylation of proteins. We're not really going to dive into that. I just want you to focus on kind of the end goal here of hydrolyzing glycogen and activating gluconeogenesis. It's all for the sake of freeing up glucose inside of these cells. And then once that glucose is free in the intracellular fluid, the basic idea is that we are going to export that glucose by facilitated diffusion back into the extracellular fluid. Okay, so to conclude here, pancreatic alpha cells will secrete glucagon when they sense that blood glucose is low. So when it's been a while since you've eaten, your blood glucose will get low, but we can counterbalance that with glucagon, which will make sure that we keep a good amount of glucose in the blood to make sure that we are feeding the brain and feeding other glucose-dependent tissues. So as glucagon causes its targets to release glucose into the blood, glucose levels will go back to normal, and through negative feedback, glucagon production will stop when we get it back into the normal range and back near set point values. 
So this is, again, just typical negative feedback that we've seen a hundred times already. Okay, so we're going to end off with a little bit of pathophysiology. Appropriately, diabetes mellitus is one of the most problematic and most unfortunately common ailments uh, throughout the entire American and Western population. So you're, of course, familiar with the idea that there are two forms of diabetes mellitus, a type 1 and a type 2. Both of them are characterized by hyperglycemia, having too much glucose in the blood, chronically too much glucose in the blood. And this is underpinned by a failure of glucose homeostasis, particularly on the insulin side. So another way of saying this is that diabetes mellitus is a failure of insulin signaling. Now where type 1 and type 2 diabetes are different from each other is in the reasons for the failure for insulin signaling. So in type 1 diabetes, this is largely genetic and it manifests usually sometime in early childhood. This is actually an autoimmune disease and it is characterized by the body's own immune system attacking the beta cells of the pancreas and destroying those cells. So if the beta cells of the pancreas are destroyed, that means that a type 1 diabetic no longer has the means to make insulin themselves, so they can't really regulate their blood glucose when it gets too high. So among other things, type 1 diabetes has to be treated with regular insulin injections. So again, the idea is that a type 1 diabetic can't make their own insulin, so they have to inject themselves with synthetic insulin. Type 2 diabetes is usually acquired in adulthood. It's usually correlated with obesity and poor lifestyle choices. This is not characterized by the inability to produce insulin. In fact, type 2 diabe diabetics actually produce quite a lot of insulin. The problem here is that type 2 diabetes is characterized by extremely poor sensitivity to insulin. So the idea is that Type 2 diabetics produce lots of insulin, it's just that their targets don't really respond to it very well. So essentially, because their blood glucose is so high all the time, those targets have become desensitized to insulin, and it's getting harder and harder and harder to get insulin to do its job. So treating type 2 diabetes is much, much, much more complicated than treating type 1 diabetes. Usually the treatments for type 2 diabetes are aimed at somehow chemically modulating the insulin signaling process to make the targets a bit more sensitive than they otherwise would be. And then in a previous lecture, we talked about how uh, the C-peptide is produced as a result of insulin processing inside of the beta cells. And we talked about how the C-peptide test measured in the blood can be a useful diagnostic tool for distinguishing between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Obviously, a type 1 diabetic would not have any detectable C-peptide in their blood at all. So that's a, usually a pretty obvious indicator. Okay, that's going to wrap up this lecture. Here is a list of vocabulary terms you probably ought to be aware of. And then for checking your understanding, number one, why are insulin and glucagon considered antagonistic hormones? Number two, I'd like you to contrast the mechanisms of insulin and glucagon. And then number three, what are the characteristics of the two types of diabetes mellitus? All right, that wraps up this video. Uh, I thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, feel free to drop it in the comment section. Otherwise, I will see you next time. So long.